Hi, I'm Mike Alpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Jerusalem. President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital should not have been a controversial issue. On the contrary, it may well have a surprisingly positive effect on the region and become the vehicle that breaks the logjam, which has blocked progress in the pursuit of a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian situation. The president is threading the needle. On the one hand, he's declaring that the United States treat Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. On the other hand, he's also signed the now infamous waiver to delay moving the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. What he's doing is testing the waters, taking measure of the backlash that will result when the United States Embassy in Israel is really moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There's a myth that needs to be busted regarding the United States and Jerusalem. This declaration made by President Trump is neither new nor groundbreaking. The United States already recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The myth centers around a congressional act during the Clinton presidency. In 1995, Congress voted on and passed a law called the Jerusalem Embassy Act. The act clearly articulates that the United States recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The act passed by an overwhelming majority. The Senate vote was 93 to 5, and it passed in the House with 374 to 37. Jerusalem is clearly a bipartisan issue, supported by both sides of the aisle. Few acts passed with such an overwhelming majority. Announcing that the United States recognizes Jerusalem as the Israeli capital is simply a restatement of what has been U.S. law since 1995. The act was so important at the time, it was passed that Congress built in a three-year grace period in which to make the move. Three years the president would have to explain why the move did not happen. That is what the infamous waiver is about. Congress included an add-on. If the embassy was not moved by 1999, the State Department will be docked 50% of its annual budget for international building and upkeep and development. Congress took the embassy issue very seriously and proved it by adding teeth to the law. And the United States even purchased the land on which to build the embassy, a parcel of no man's land in Jerusalem's Tapiot Arnona neighborhood near the old Diplomat Hotel. And they have built a sprawling facility there. Almost every president and presidential candidate since 1995 has promised to move the embassy, everyone with the glaring exception of President Barack Obama. After President Trump made the Jerusalem announcement, there were increased tensions, warnings that threats of short-term violent flare-ups. One leader even called the announcement a declaration of war. In the end, it will only be a blip on the larger landscape. At least, that is the Trump plan. And there's, here's a newsflash. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, even if almost every country in the world chooses not to accept that fact. Jerusalem is the seat of the Israeli parliament. The Supreme Court of Israel is there, and the executive branch of the government is there since 1949 and January of 1950. Jerusalem is home to the president and the prime minister of Israel. Yet somehow Israel has been denied the right to declare their capital and have it recognized by her friends and allies, not to mention her enemies. Historically, the United States has always been afraid of possible blowback on the issue of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the only city in the world with two U.S. consulates, one in East Jerusalem that was under Jordanian control until June of 67, and one in West Jerusalem. Once upon a time, Berlin had two U.S. embassies, but they were in different countries and were unified after the wall came down. The Jerusalem consulate is the only U.S. consular office in the world that reports directly to Foggy Bottom, i.e. the State Department in Washington, and not to its own embassy in the country. Everyone has something to say about Jerusalem. Of late, some serious proposals have been raised, most notably the proposal put forth by Saudi Arabia. The Saudi proposal is a redo of their earlier proposal and is similar to a plan recommended by the United States and others. 
because it comes from the Saudi Arabians, and the, the Palestinians actually might take it seriously. Regarding Jerusalem, the Saudi plan suggests that Abu Dis be named the Palestinian capital. Abu Dis is located just under the Mount of Olives. It is closer to the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock than is the Knesset, Israel's parliament. In the year 2000, while Yasser Arafat was still alive, work began to build the Palestinians' parliamentary building right there in Abu Dis. I toured the site while it was under construction and was most impressed by Arafat's presidential suite. He had the perfect view of the Dome of the Rock, not only from his office, but even from a narrow floor-to-ceiling window in the private presidential powder room. I kid you not, the building stands incomplete to this very day. According to the demarcations in the Oslo Accords, Abu Dis is in Area B. That means it's under Palestinian Authority civil control and Israeli military control. Abu Dis really is Jerusalem, but not. The name Abu Dis is an Arabic perversion of Abu Dius. Abu in Arabic means father of, and in this case, Dis is Dius, which in, is Latin for God. It is the area where Jesus spent the last few days of his life before he was arrested by the Romans. Certain Arab leaders have concluded that Abbas cannot make a decision about Jerusalem because he will lose face and control, hence the threat of violence as a way to help him save face and maintain control over the Palestinian Authority. But maybe if the proposal about Jerusalem was floated by representatives of large mainstream Arab countries like the Saudis and the Egyptians and even President Trump, the issue could be resolved with no honor lost. Right now, the Palestinians want to garner Arab and Muslim support. The timing of the waiver signing fits perfectly into their agenda. Now, they can use the statement on Jerusalem by President Trump to orchestrate international condemnation of Israel and the United States. The problem is that anger and hate are not replacements for a real commitment to create a genuine Palestinian state. A Palestinian state needs to be built on a creative dream, not on hatred and protests against Israel. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. I want to discuss four columns today, all about Jerusalem. I truncated the background briefing in order to make space to discuss more columns today. The columns are from all over the spectrum, left and right, and they all show a deep understanding of the issue. First up is a column from Alan Dershowitz. The column ran December 7th, 2017, in both the Washington Examiner and the Fox News website. It's entitled, Why Trump is Right in Recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's Capital. Dershowitz begins by laying blame on Obama and not Trump. He says that Obama changed the status quo, not Trump. Here's how he begins. President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital is a perfect response to President Obama's benighted decision to change American policy by engineering the United Nations Security Council resolution declaring Judaism's holiest places in Jerusalem to be occupied territory and a flagrant violation under international law. It was President Obama who changed the status quo and made peace more difficult by handing the Palestinians enormous leverage in future negotiations by disincentivizing them from making a compromised peace. Dershowitz explains that Obama did what Obama did at the United Nations Security Council and how it upended the United States position on Israel and Jerusalem. It had long been American foreign policy to veto any one-sided Security Council resolutions that declared Judaism's holiest places to be illegally occupied. Obama's decision to change that policy was not based on American interest or in the interest of peace. It was done out of personal revenge against Prime Minister Netanyahu and an act of pique by the outgoing president. It was also designed to improperly tie the hands of President-elect Trump. President Trump is doing the right thing by telling the United Nations that the United States now rejects the one-sided UN Security Council resolution. Now Dershowitz quotes from the resolution showing how blatantly one-sided and biased it is and why it should never have been passed except to hurt Israel and Netanyahu. He writes, So, if there is any change to the status quo, let the blame lie where it should be, at the hands of President Obama, for his cowardly decision to wait until he was a lame duck president to get 
even with Prime Minister Netanyahu. President Trump deserves praise for restoring balance in negotiations with Israel and the Palestinians. It was President Obama who made peace more difficult. It was President Trump who made it more feasible again. The outrageously one-sided Security Council resolution declared that, quote, any changes to the four June 67 lines, including with regard to Jerusalem, have no legal validity and constitutes a flagrant violation under international law, unquote. This means, among other things, that Israel's decision to build a plaza for prayer at the Western Wall, Judaism's holiest site, constitutes a flagrant violation of international law. This resolution was therefore not limited to settlements in the West Bank, as the Obama administration later claimed in the bait and switch. The resolution applied equally to the very heart of Israel. Then Dershowitz describes the history of how Israel opened and gave access to religious sites in Jerusalem, while no one else ever had done that before. And he concludes saying that Trump was correct in untying U.S. hands regarding Jerusalem. He concludes, after the United Nations, at the urging of President Obama, made it a continuing international crime for there to be any Israeli presence in the disputed areas of Jerusalem, including areas of Jewish provenance, is beyond dispute. President Trump was right to untie his own hands and undo the damage wrought by his predecessor. Some have argued that the United States should not recognize Jerusalem because it will stimulate violence by Arab terrorists. No American decision should ever be influenced by the threat of violence. Terrorists should not have a veto over American policy. If the United States were to give in to threat of violence, it would only incentivize others to threaten violence in response to any peace plan. So let's praise President Trump for doing the right thing by undoing the wrong thing President Obama did at the end of his presidency. Next up is a column from the New York Times. and It was written by Shmuel Rosner. Rosner is the political editor at the Jewish Journal, a senior fellow at the People Policy Institute and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. This piece was published online on December 5th and in print on December 6, 2017. Rosner is a clear thinker and with great insight. He begins with praise of Trump's point of view, and he gives perspective and history. The column is datelined Jerusalem. Rosner writes, How long do you think there has been a Jewish temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem? That is the question I like to ask when I'm leading a discussion with Israelis or Jews from other countries. The most common response is 2,000 years. But that actually is the answer to a separate question. How long ago did the Romans destroy the Second Temple, beginning the Jewish exile? According to many scholars, there was a temple on that site for nearly a thousand years before the Roman destruction. That would mean that for about 3,000 years, Jerusalem has been the center of the Jewish people, a physical center when the temple was standing and a center for prayer and longing from afar after the Jews were dispersed around the globe. Every year, at the very end of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, and at the end of the Passover Seder, Jews recite next year in Jerusalem. Now Rosner moves back to our day and tries to clarify the entire issue of Jerusalem. He writes, Then the Jews came back. In the 19th century, Jews began building neighborhoods and settling outside the walls of Jerusalem's old city. Then the Six-Day War of 1967 ended the short Jordanian rule over the old city and united Jerusalem under Israeli jurisdiction. But this return has proved more controversial internationally. Even the United States, Israel's closest ally, has not recognized the city as our capital, even though our government has been based there since 1949. Rosner rightly points out that the position of the United States will not change anything. He writes, not that a statement from an American president will actually change Israelis' commitment to Jerusalem. This is our capital, and it will always be. It was taken away from the Jewish people by force. It was recaptured by force. And if necessary, it will be preserved under Israel's jurisdiction by force too. In conclusion, Rosner explains Trump's actions, comparing Trump to Truman and Truman's recognition of Israel in 1948 when Israel declared itself a state. He writes, it would be a great exaggeration to argue that Mr. Trump bears much resemblance to Harry Truman, but the president often criticized for being blunt and never shying away from saying what he wants to say, 
will have his Truman-esque moment by refusing to pretend that Israel has no capital. If violence is the result of that, we will all regret it. But it is worth remembering that Truman's recognition of Israel was also met with violence, and it is still remembered as a great American moment. Third up is also from the New York Times. It is from the Sunday Times, the Weekly Review. It is entitled, Palestinians Dashed Hopes for Jerusalem. It's written by a Palestinian lawyer named Raja Shehade. It appeared online on December 9th and in print on Sunday, December 10th. Shahada is the author of Where the Line is Drawn, a tale of crossings, friendships, and 50 years of occupation in Israel-Palestine. Shahada brings a moderate Palestinian voice to the discussion and expresses his disappointment with Trump's decision. The article is datelined Ramallah West Bank. He sets the stage for his disappointment. Here is how he begins. My nephew Aziz, a bright young man who returned to Ramallah this summer after studying in London, called me on Thursday morning, the day after the decision by the United States to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I don't know what can be done, he said, with obvious pain in his voice. I didn't have much to propose. I had just heard the announcement from the nearby mosque calling on people to go to the center of town at noon. There we could gather to denounce the American decision. I suggested to my nephew that we go there together and see what was happening. Next, Shahada shows the practical side of not protesting and not getting involved. He does this by giving the point of view of the taxi driver. The taxi driver is seen as the perfect MOS, the man on the street interview. No one has their finger on the pulse better than the taxi driver in that part of the world. He continues. On the way over, the taxi driver told me that he felt let down by the Palestinian response to the news. I asked him about the call of the Hamas leaders, Ismail Haniyeh, for another intifada. What intifada? When we were all burdened with loans, he answered. 30 years ago, I never thought twice about taking part in every strike that was announced. But now, if I don't make money, I will not be able to pay back the bank loan on this car. And then, will I survive without it? Next, Shahada sees an old friend, a musician, and they compare this event to the first Intifada 30 years ago. He writes, I asked around to see if anyone knew the plan for the day. I'm a stranger to social media, and I thought I could have missed an announcement. Ramzi, a musician I've known for many years, had also come intending to take part in the demonstration. He said he kept obsessively checking Facebook and found nothing. There were no mobile phones during the first Intifada when I was a boy of 10 in the Amari refugee camp. Yet I remember that people knew when to assemble and what to do, he said. He noted the scarcity of young participants at the gathering. Some people, he said, feel they can stay home and yet consider that they are taking part. They think that they can have virtual participation. He concluded by saying, spirits are low. The leadership has abandoned Jerusalem. Shahada concludes saying that he was frustrated and dismayed. That evening I went home feeling dismayed that Washington's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital was made with no consideration of the discrimination and underdevelopment of the past 50 years designed to drive Palestinians out of the city. The United States not only has confirmed its bias in favor of Israel, but also has given approval to the kind of relations between Israel and Palestine that cannot possibly be the basis for peace and coexistence. What I witnessed on Thursday was a mild beginning to what may develop into a sustained violent expression of pent-up anger felt by most Palestinians, whether they live in Jerusalem or outside. On Friday, thousands of protesters in Jerusalem, Gaza, and here in the West Bank took to the streets. At least two Palestinians were killed and 100 wounded. President Trump might have unwittingly lit a fuse that Israel may have great difficulty putting out. The fourth and final column today is from the New York Post. It was written by John Podhoretz, entitled, Trump's Truth-Telling on Jerusalem Marks an All-New Middle East. It was published on December 6, 2017, online and December 7th in print. Podhoretz writes for the New York Post. Podhoretz is a mainstream Republican thinker whose views are embraced by the right side of the spectrum of American politics. This is how he begins. This is nothing more or less than the recognition of reality, President Trump said in announcing America's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. 
Never have truer words been spoken, and they were delivered in the best speech Trump has ever given. What Trump did was stunning. He could just have signed the waiver of the law passed in 1995, compelling the executive branch to move America's embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He did it six months ago, just like his three immediate predecessors did every six months since 1996. Or he could have not signed the waiver and simply said he was going to start the process of building a new embassy. But Hartz continues explaining that Trump called the bluff of the world. He writes, instead, he called the international community's seven-decade bluff and ended the delusion about the future that has prevented Palestinians from seeing the world and their own geopolitical situation clearly. It is a bold shift. The idea that Jerusalem is not Israel's capital has been a global pretense for decades, including here in the United States. It's a pretense because Jerusalem has been Israel's capital from the moment the new country secured a future by winning a bloody war for independence, waged against it by Arab nations after they rejected the UN partition of the old British mandate into a Jewish state and an Arab state. But Hartz concludes by giving the Palestinians a lesson saying that their issue is simply not as important as they think it is or it once was. The Palestinians' refusal to accept Israel for what it is and what it has become has been the greatest bar to peace. And there are reasons to believe the so-called Arab street has bigger problems to concern itself with right now than Israel's capital. And not just the street, the capitals as well. Trump's act comes at a time when there's a tectonic shift in the Middle East. If I had told you 20 years ago that Israel would one day find itself in a de facto alliance with Saudi Arabia and Egypt, you would have had me committed. But two weeks ago, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman reportedly urged the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas to sign on to a peace deal Israel actually likes. MBS isn't happy about Trump's move, but that doesn't change the fact that the sands are shifting rapidly after decades of stagnation. In the end, as Trump said, Israel is a sovereign nation with the right, like every other sovereign nation, to determine its own capital. Indeed it is. Indeed it does. Bravo. One issue, four opinions. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. Let's discuss four cartoons today. The All Deal with Jerusalem, the first cartoon is by Signe Wilkinson and was published in the Philadelphia Daily News on December 8, 2017. A group of Native Americans are on the front lawn of the White House. President Trump is at the door. The leader of the Native Americans says, in recognition of our presence here since biblical times, we declare this to be our capital. Next up is a cartoon by Bronco and is found in conservativenews.com, published December 8, 2017. In the background is the Israeli Knesset, and in front is Trump and Bibi with an Israeli flag. Next to them is a donkey, meaning and symbolizing the Democrats, and Obama hugging them. And they're shouting the word Hitler and pointing their finger at Trump and Bibi. The third cartoon is by Nate Beeler, and it's from the Columbus Dispatch, and was published on December 7, 2017. The cartoon is split top and bottom. The top reads, American textbooks, old and new. And the bottom section reads, Palestinian textbooks, old and new. The old American textbook shows a map with a capital star, and the page reads, Israel, Israeli flag, capital city, Tel Aviv. The next textbook has a map and a star where Jerusalem is, and reads, Israel, Israeli flag, capital city, Jerusalem. The old Palestinian textbook reads, wipe Israel off the map. And the picture is of a tombstone which says R.I.P., rest in peace. The new textbook reads the same thing, wipe Israel off the map, and the tombstone which reads R.I.P. This final cartoon is by Scott Stantis, and it's from the Chicago Tribune, published on, June, on December 7, 2017. Uncle Sam and Bibi are on a mountain in the desert with an Israeli flag that symbolizes Jerusalem. Rockets are descending on them from all sides. The rockets read, death to Israel. Uncle Sam says, but wouldn't moving our embassy to Jerusalem make some people angry? Bibi answers, you get used to it. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. 
Israel destroyed another terror tunnel recently. The tunnel started in Gaza, crossed under the Israeli border, and ended up several hundred yards into an Israeli agricultural area. After the tunnel was discovered, Israel monitored the activities until they destroyed it. There was no one inside. The tunnel is the second tunnel in a month that was destroyed. The previous tunnel was built by Islamic Jihad. There were no weapons in the tunnel, and it was destroyed very differently than others. It was not hit by missiles from the air, but collapsed by ground equipment. It appears that Hamas was aware of the tunnel and that the tunnel was discovered because there was no real usage of the tunnel during the time that it was being monitored by Israel. Only minutes before Israel destroyed the tunnel, Hamas made a big announcement that Israel would pay a heavy price for their actions. The Hamas message said that Israel will soon be taught a lesson. Ever wonder how Israel discovered the two terror tunnels crossing from Gaza into their sovereign land? The tunnels opened up well within Israel and were designed to enable Hamas and Islamic Jihad access in attacking Israelis and condemning Israeli soldiers. Israel discovered the tunnels by using their new, very unique technology. The system is called the lab. The lab harnesses human intelligence, scientific brain power, computers and other machi machinery, and guides users to uncover tunnels. The lab uses an algorithm that, is, that literally takes all the guesswork out of finding the tunnels. This is the first time in history that the mechanism has been developed to discover tunnels. It is pure math and science. In other words, the lab actually has done the impossible. It finds something that until now was undetectable. Hamas is dumbfounded. The lab is top secret, but it is certainly working. This is new defense. When applied in full operation, will effectively protect Israel and destroy one of Hamas's most effective and aggressive weapons. There is no reason it cannot be used to discover Hezbollah tunnels in the north with Lebanon. Hamas may be forced to prematurely use their incomplete tunnels to attack Israel before the tunnels are discovered. It is a risk that Israel faces, but an unlikely one. Hamas does not want to escalate tensions with Israel at this time, but neither can they afford to just lose their investment in their tunnels. It is an issue of pride as well as money. Given the effectiveness of the lab, Hamas will have to either ratchet up their tunnel use or throw in the towel and abandon it totally. I predict Hamas will try one more time with their tunnels and then scrap the tunnel warfare totally. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the modern city of Jerusalem grew out of a need to break out of the old walls of the city of Jerusalem because of population explosion, and because of hygiene, epidemics, and plagues? It all happened in 1860. The very first person to sponsor a community outside the walls was Sir Moses Montefiore in a community called Mishkanot Shananim, Heavenly Tabernacles. And actually, the money for Montefiore's project was donated by New Orleans Jewish philanthropist Judah B. Toro. That is where the famous Jerusalem windmill was and still is. The idea of the windmill was that those residents needed to earn money to provide for themselves, and the windmill would grind wheat into flour and provide an income. Originally, the residents came out during the day and returned into the protected walled city at night. Then they eventually stayed out. The windmill worked but then broke. The cogs and the sprockets were European made and crumbled under the dry climate conditions of Jerusalem. Soon other communities popped up and the new city outside the walls developed. Jerusalem's new city growth came in the guise of neighborhoods. They were established just off the main road into and out of Jerusalem called Jaffa Road. The rest is history. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. 
Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.